to invite our second speaker, uh, Michel Clasens, who is somebody who I think probably has one of the most challenging jobs in science communication today. Um, he is responsible for communication at ITER, which is the big international uh, nuclear fusion project being constructed at the moment in the south of France. And um, this is extremely relevant to the future of the planet, to the future uh, provision of energy needs. One of the challenges that Michel has is overcoming the perception that nuclear fusion energy will be, has always been 30 years away and always will be 30 years away in the future. Um, I hope we're going to learn a little bit about that and hopefully learn that it's not true. Michel. Science, which is often associated to uh, knowledge, pure knowledge, science <coughs> symbolized by this pure form on the slide here. To what extent science is transparent? And I will take the case study of ITER, as uh, James said, which is the biggest nuclear fusion reactor which is now building uh, in the south of France. <coughs> so, in terms of press coverage, we are doing quite well, as you can see on this slide, with a um, rough average of 500 press clippings and internet media reports every month, so this is quite good result at first stage. <coughs> and this is quite surprising, because ITER at the moment, this is this. This is essentially a platform. Um, and almost nothing on it. We are just uh, building, as you can see on this, the, the, the picture, three uh, buildings out of the 39 that will be uh, on the side by 2000, 2020. <coughs> the reason for this uh, extensive press coverage is, I think, can be explained by um, what um, Ben Goldbeck which, who is a science and medical journalist at the Guardian, wrote in his book, Bad Science. <clears throat> For him, there are basically three types of science stories in the media. The wacky stories, gadget, money is going for nothing. The breakthrough stories, which account for the tea part of the media reports, and the scare stories. And I think that in ITER there is a little bit of the three categories. ITER will be uh, this uh, nuclear fusion reactor, the biggest in the world. There are approximately uh, a dozen of reactors working at the moment in the world, but this will be the biggest. And you see the human scale in uh, the bottom of the, the, the drawing. Basically, we will try to realize the reactions that occur in the stars and in the sun. So these reactions are very natural and frequent in the universe, but they are more difficult to realize on Earth, because you need to heat up a hydrogen gas up to 100 million degrees. This is what happened in one of the fusion reactors. You see, this is a... Sorry, no, it's very quick. It's a, a torus which is filled up by a hydrogen gas up to 100 million degrees. <clears throat> but the, the gas, which we call the plasma at this high temperature, as you can see, is very diluted um, because there are hardly one or two grams, grams of fuel in the reactor. 
and the plasma at high temperature is transparent. It emits no visible light. Um, sorry, let's, let's show the video again. So it's only the coldest part of the plasma along the wall which emits visible light. The rest emit X-rays or gamma rays. You don't see them. So it's very diluted. Not a big, ex not, not explosion, explosive at all. So this is what we are going to try to do in uh, ITER, and this will be the largest uh, experiment in the world. It's probably the most uh, ambitious scientific and technological project today in the world because it involves 34 countries. China, EU, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the US. So, Okay, this is a drawing of the site when it will be completed. Oh, sorry. Pushing the one button. <coughs> one of the criticisms that it um, is attracting is the huge cost. Um, although most media reports do not quote the right figure, the cost of construction of ITER at the moment is estimated 12.8 billion of euros, close to 13 billion of euros. So um, only 40% of the media reports give a good figure. This has been criticized often, including by the scientific community. Although we have to divide this big amount, by the number of countries involved, 34, and the duration of the construction, which, which is 10 years. <clears throat> it's interesting to see that uh, France, for example, contribution in Italy is about the same as in Seoul, but most French people do not have any problem with Seoul, like, although they have one uh, with Italy. And the International Space Station budget at the moment is close to 100 billion of dollars. So I divided here on the, the chart the, the, the investment of the members in ITER by the public research spending. And you see <coughs> it's uh, around 1-2%. Uh, the chart is more impressive, I think, if we use the, the full scale one to or zero to one hundred percent, and you see that budget, the budget uh, of ITER is teeny, a very small uh, amount compared to the public spending in research uh, of the, the members uh, of the ITER members. Main communication issues, in my opinion, are uh, the fact that ITER is neither a pure science nor a technology project. So, it's, people have some difficulty with it. So, it's, now, it's neither uh, fundamental research, but it's not um, a, a pure technology project. Problem also is the fact that uh, ITER originated from um, the, politi the politics, and it has been proposed by Gorbachev and Reagan in 1985. <clears throat> it's also a long-term project. First results will not um, occur uh, within um, uh, less than uh, nine years. So, therefore, it's of little interest for the politicians. Most of them. <coughs> Criticism also include um, problems were raised by the scientific community like disruptions, which are instabilities in the plasma. And also the fact that it will really, uh, handle tritium, which is a radioactive gas, with a short uh, life, but opponents are keen to quote the uh, Japanese Nobel Prize, who said uh, once that tritium um, is a highly toxic uh, substance, and the two kilos of tritium that will be used by ITER can kill two million people. 
we do not understand how this Nobel uh, Prize winner uh, arrived to this conclusion. Um, well, simply divided two kilos by the lethal dose of one milligram, and this gives you the figure of two million people. But uh, it would be very hard to kill two million people with two kilos of tritium. Simulations have shown that tritium, which is hydrogen, basically, is a very volatile and light gas that would uh, very quickly uh, uh, go up in the atmosphere. <clears throat> Main concern uh, for it is that we are not transparent at all at the moment. There is no signage on the roads in the region. It's, the site is not visible from the outside, so it gives uh, an impression of secrecy, which uh, would, we should correct because um, the site can be visited by uh, the, lay, the lay person. And of course, we have also to be visible on the website, on the internet, that's quite obvious. And basically, we are keen to communicate by numbers. As you know, journalists love figures, love data. And here we have a, a bunch, a wealth of uh, data. And also impressive pictures about the work site. Now, if we have to reach, if we want to reach a wide public, obviously you have to turn your science into what I call media science. But this is a very um, peculiar uh, face of science. Media science, that is science in the media, is not just about pure science. Forget about science. Science journalism today also is under strong pressure. Uh, most media are reducing uh, the number of science journalists. Also, um, there is um, a big uh, control of the news in the media by the big uh, science jour journal today, who are becoming um, really news agencies. And one, fa one fact that is, uh, I think, more and more common is the fact that the media report essentially on published science, science that is published in the scientific literature. So the whole science that is being developed, which is the majority of it, is almost invisible to the public. And there are good reasons to it. <clears throat> also the fact that um, program producers on the radio and on TV refrain to invite scientists in their discussions because they say scientists become quickly un ununderstandable and use um, complicated jargon. Still, I'm convinced that science needs more media, media science today. And as we have a scientific method which is widely accepted, I believe there is also a journalistic method. And from my point of view also, what is interesting is that we can judge the maturity of an organization of, or a project by its reaction to uh, the media. So this is in short, my key message, and uh, I thank you for your attention.